we have to watch out for the profiteers, those people, the pirates, the uh, the people who lie and wait along the the path of these shortcuts to the right answer, uh, because they want to exploit us. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. It's the last week of 2022, and after releasing over 200 new videos this year, my content editor Jason and I are attempting to spend a week enjoying the holidays with our families. Now that said, I know this is a week when many of you are away from work and have extra time to watch videos, and I don't want you to leave disappointed. So I've dug into the Wealthy on Archives and selected a few gems to rerun this week, starting with today's video, which is one of my all-time favorites. Dr. Robert Cialdini wrote the award-winning and best-selling book, Influence, which is hands down one of the most useful books I've read in terms of understanding the world in which we live. This is one of my top favorite interviews I've yet done for Wealthion, and once you watch it, I guarantee you won't see the world the same way. Enjoy. Hello, folks. Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion.com here, welcoming you to a very special interview. Today, we're being joined by Dr. Robert Cialdini, famously known as the godfather of influence. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and he's the Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Marketing at Arizona State University. Uh, Bob's books include Influence and Persuasion. He's sold more than 7 million copies in 44 different languages. Um, he's known globally as the foundational expert in the science of influence and how to apply it ethically in business. His six principles of persuasion have become a cornerstone for any organization seriously about uh, increasing their influence. Bob, I'm, I'm just so thrilled you can join us today. I, I've got to admit to some hero worship here. Your work has really shaped the way I see the world. It's an honor to have you here on the program. Well, that's very gratifying to hear, Adam. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thanks. And I presume for folks who aren't familiar with your work, you're going to be one of their heroes as well after we have this conversation. Um, so let's get right into it here. Um, uh, I'm really interested in this conversation of getting to how we can recognize and defend ourselves from the bombardment of daily attempts, both overt and surreptitious, to influence our behavior. But first, for those who might be unfamiliar with your work, can you explain why we humans are so susceptible to these attempts to influence us? Yes, and it has to do with the fact that most of the time, these principles of influence that I talk about steer us correctly. They provide us ec excellent counsel as to when to say yes to a request, proposal, recommendation that we receive uh, because uh, they, and because they do, then those individuals who want to move us in their direction harness the power of those principles to get us to move in that direction. And most of the time, if they have honestly pointed to one or another of these tendencies that we typically uh, take in order to increase our outcomes, uh, they will have steered us correctly. But we have to watch out for the profiteers, those people, the pirates, the, uh, the people who lie and wait along the, the path of these shortcuts to the right answer uh, because they want to exploit us ma by manufacturing or fabricating uh, those principles. Great. And uh, I, I know in your book, Influence, you talk about, um, you call it the click were response, but these yeah. are these are shortcuts, as you're saying. They're, they're ways in which we make decisions quickly um, because they work for us 99% of the time. Um, but to your point, these, these you know, potential pirates um, can if they understand that code, they can learn how to crack it and basically use those shortcuts against us, almost like a like a computer hacker will hack a computer. Um, I'll let you expand on this, but but one example you talk about in your book of this, um, it's in uh, turkeys, uh, not humans, but it's similar to some of the responses that humans have, where turkeys and polecats, which basically a weasel, um, they are just natural enemies. And if a turkey, mother turkey sees a polecat, she'll just become enraged and, and try to kill it because she doesn't want it to eat her chicks. Um, so she has this biological response to just destroy the polecat. Um, and her baby chicks, when they make the little cheap noise, 
she has a strong biological prerogative to care for them. And one of those actually trumps the other, meaning if you put a polecat in with a weasel, sorry, a polecat in with a turkey, and it's got a recorder on it that makes the little cheap of the, the baby chick, the mother turkey, instead of flying into a rage, will actually care for the polecat. So she, her, her biological responses are being hacked. And, and to your point, they're so powerful for us. If people are able to take advantage of those, um, we can be getting duped without really even being aware of it. Is that correct? It is. <clears throat> Let me give you a human uh, analog to that story. Uh, the word because triggers in us a willingness to accept the next thing we hear because typically a reason follows the word because. And we are programmed to want reasons for what we do. So there's this great study done in a, a, a library at Harvard University where there was a line of people waiting to use the copying machine and a researcher walked up to the to the front of the line and said, excuse me, uh, could I skip ahead of you because I'm in a rush, right? And 93% of the people said yes, right? Because I'm in a rush. She used uh, another because and added no real reason, right? She said, because I have to make some copies. Well, that's just stating the obvious. Everybody in that <laughs> line has to make some cut. 93% let her go ahead. It was because the word because was used and people responded to that trigger in the same way that mother turkeys respond to the trigger of the cheap, cheap sound that their baby chicks make and pr produce maternal behavior the word because produces compliant behavior. Well, and what I love about your work, Bob, is once you're exposed to it, you, you sort of see it everywhere. You recognize that we live in a world of attempts to influence our behavior all the time. And just using this because example, you know, if you look at any type of marketing that's out there, it always offers the because or the reason, whether it's a good reason or not, right? So uh, chew Trident gum because four to five dentists recommend it, right? Uh, eat our breakfast cereal because it's fortified with nine essential, you know, vitamins and minerals. Um, L'Oreal, their, uh, their tagline is because you're worth it, which yes. doesn't say anything specific, but it's just leveraging that because. So it's a really um, enlightening way uh, to see the world once, once the veil has been lifted from your eyes in terms of all of these, you know, principles of science that are being used, as you say, to drive compliant behavior. Um, all right. So, right. so, and by the way, I'll say that it's not all marketing attempts. It's not all advertising efforts. Some forget to use the word because they just show a scene, a positive scene with <clears throat> favorable uh, outcomes or uh, attractive people uh, using their product. They forget the trigger and they sink. Those approaches sink. Well, and so I think this is, you know, a, a testament to the huge value of, of your work and what you've uncovered here, which is it, it provides a blueprint for people who are, who are having trouble maybe in relationships in terms of trying to get people on the same page as they, well, here are ways to try to bridge those gaps more effectively. Or to your point as a business, hey, we're trying to drive consumers to buy our product, use our services, et cetera. Maybe we're not speaking to them as effectively as possible. Let's use some of these tenants here and see, you know, let's audit our marketing and, and make sure that it's actually using these effectively, you know, where are we falling down? Where are we being deficient? So this is a great segue into my next question, which is um, in your just truly excellent book, um, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, um, you detail out what you call the six principles of persuasion that science shows us are particularly effective in getting people to engage in the type of behavior that you want. Um, can you do your best just to, to quickly dial through those and summarize each one and why it's important? Yeah, let me do that with an example in each case. The first is the principle of reciprocation. It's a rule that says we are trained from childhood in every human culture, by the way. 
There's not a single human society that fails to train its members in this rule from childhood, which says, I am obligated to give back to you the form of behavior you have first given to me. Right? If you get, if you invite me to a party, I should invite you to one of mine, and so on. Right? But if you do me a favor, I owe you a favor. And I'll say very simply, in the context of obligation, people say yes to those they owe. The implication is we have to give first, give benefits, give advantage, advantages, give information, give something of worth, and people will stand on the balls of their feet ready to give back to us. Second principle is one no one would dispute, liking. We prefer to say yes to those people we like. No surprise there. But there are two small things we can do to increase the willingness of people to give us that rapport. One is to point to genuine similarities that exist between us. When that was done in a bargaining experiment, the number of deadlock negotiations, right, when people first gave information to one another that allowed them to see complementary interests and hobbies and so on, the number of, of deadlock negotiations dropped from 30% to 6%. Second thing you can do is give genuine compliments. Not only do we like people who are like us, we, we like people who do like us and say so. So <clears throat> genuine compliments, that's the other. Next principle is the principle of social proof. People say yes to those who can give them evidence that a lot of other individuals like them have been saying yes to this request. So uh, if you, uh, for example, in, in a study done in McDonald's, if you say to people at the end of their order, would you like to order one of our desserts, right? our uh, Frosty, whatever it was, uh, I can't remember, is our most popular. Orders of Frosty go, go up 54% just by telling people what's popular. Next is the principle of authority. People say yes to those who can give them evidence that what they're suggesting is consistent with the voices of genuine experts, authorities, people with credentials and knowledge in the matter. So testimonials from acknowledged experts should always be included in any messaging. And here's where I would once again say a lot of times the marketers and advertisers get this wrong because they don't put the testimonials at the top of their message. They're buried somewhere in the middle or at the end. The testimonials should go first. So all of the aura of authority infuses every line of what comes next. Right? Next principle is the principle of commitment and consistency. People want to be consistent with what they have already said or done. Right? So in one study in a restaurant, uh, the manager was able to get the number of no-shows at that restaurant to drop significantly by asking his receptionist when she took a booking to say not just uh, thank you for calling our restaurant. Uh, please call us if you have to change uh, or your reservation or cancel. She said, will you please call us if you have to change or cancel your reservation and waited for a reply. And everybody said, of course. And no shows dropped by 67% because people were on record as making a commitment to that activity, and then they were willing to live up to it to a much greater degree. Next principle is scarcity. People go a little crazy when they think that what something they want or something that's, uh, that's uh, attractive is rare or scarce or dwindling in availability to them. Right? So, honestly informing people of any 
dwindling availability of options available or, uh, or products or services is certainly one thing. But the other thing we often forget to do is to tell them what it is about our product or service or idea that is unique, that can't be obtained anywhere else. That's a scarcity manipulation, even for companies that have as much information or products or services as there are to request. Tell people what is unique. They can't get anywhere else, and then they'll jump in your direction. And there's finally, I've added a seventh principle, the principle uh, the, of unity, the idea that if a communicator can convince an audience that he or she is of them, one of them, a member of a group in which they have a, a, an important social or personal identity, everything within the influence process becomes easier. People say yes to those who are of them, one of them. So for example, there was a study done on a college campus. Uh, the uh, researchers had a young woman, college A woman, looked like a student, uh, standing on campus and as people walked by said, excuse me, would you be willing to donate to the United Way? And she got some form, some level of, of uh, contributions. But if she preceded that by saying, I'm a student here too, contributions doubled. Actually, they more than doubled. Just by saying, I'm of you, right, was enough to bring down all the walls against a contribution. All right, um, got so many questions and uh, directions I'd like to take the discussion in after uh, all the, that excellent uh, recap you just went through there. The, the key takeaway that I take from it that uh, I really wanna make sure viewers take away as well is in pretty much every example you just listed there, Bob, it was an example of a small investment on behalf of the agent uh, that then led to a big action on behalf of the recipient, right? So these are ways in which you can give a little nudge, you know, like you say, you can just add a little phrase, change of phrase a little bit and, you know, double your conversions or, you know, desired actions you want, whatnot. Right. These are ways to sort of nudge the universe. Are, not only are they um, costless, in terms of time, they're costless in terms of resources. It, it costs us nothing to add, at, will you, or <laughs> I'm like you in this, or I'm of you, some kind of message oh, like that. Well, the McFlurry is our most popular the dessert. McFlurry, <laughs> that's right, yeah, is our most popular. It, it's, it's one more breath, and you get 54% more spend so here's the crux of the question that i i want to ask you on this interview which is um you know folks if you haven't read bob's books you read them it's all backed by science and, and the experiments that he's mentioning here um so these little costless um you know, uh, they're costless. They don't take much uh, effort on, on behalf of the people that are implementing them, uh, but they yield these big results. Um, they're incredibly effective, as Bob has just described here. Um, Bob, you know, can these, once you understand them, is the danger of this understanding that, that these tenets, these principles can be used either for good or for evil? You know, are there people that are deliberately trying to use these things to manipulate us, either to buy their product or to vote a certain way, um, or to just take behavior that actually is in their best interest, not our own? There is such a danger. It's, it's a concern that's beset me since the first time I wrote this, but not because it's unique to the principles of influence. There's no piece of information that can't be corrupted, that can't be twisted, so that it is not just used for good, it is also used for ill. I think about these principles like sticks of dynamite. You can use dynamite to build a bridge, you know, <laughs> or you can use dynamite to blow up a bridge, to destroy a bridge. They can always be used for good or ill. 
we can't use that fact to eliminate the the information that we send to the world about how they work, how these principles work, how they as human beings work, the readers of this information. So for me, the important thing was to identify what constitutes the ethical use and what constitutes the ethically objectionable use of these principles. All right. So um, getting into that territory, then, I, I guess, first, are, are there instances slash examples that particularly bother you on the ethical side of things here that you see in the world? Yes. So, for example, let me give you a personal example uh, that came from uh, a, a few years ago. I was in a uh, I was in an appliance store and I was looking for something else, but my eye was caught by a big screen TV that I knew was very highly rated from consumer reports and was on a drastic sale. And I went in front of it and there were some brochures on the uh, on the counter and I was looking through them and a, a salesperson came up to me and said, I see you're interested in this set. At this price, it's it's a great deal. Uh, I can see why you're interested, but I have to tell you, it's our last one, right? Scarcity. And then he upped the ante by saying, and I just got a phone call from a woman who said she's probably going to come to the store this afternoon and buy it. You know, I'm supposed to be the doctor of influence. <laughs> but you Three have your own buttons later, as a human. <laughs> I'm wheeling out of the store with this set in my cart. Let's let's dis uh, because if we disentangle what he did, I think we get to the point that really I want to make about what's ethical and what's not ethical. If he was telling me the truth that this really was the last of this model. There weren't any back in the storeroom. There weren't any at any other locations. This was it, right? He was my ally in the process. He steered me properly into making an educated, purely, that is, a productively informed decision. If I knew that, Suppose he, this was the last one. It really was the last one. And he didn't tell me. And I went home to think it over and then came back that evening to buy it because I decided I wanted. And he said, oh, sorry, it's our last one. It was our last one. And I sold it to a woman this afternoon. I would have said, what? It was your last one and you didn't tell me? about the true scarcity that applied to this situation? What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> okay, suppose instead <clears throat> it wasn't the last one. He just told me it was to get me agitated and attracted to it to the point where I would buy it. Then he went back to the storeroom and put another one on the shelf and did it again. And here's where I, uh, it, it, my response to your question, have I seen this happen before? It turns out Best Buy employees, the Best Buy store, were caught doing this as a sales strategy a few years ago right? and indicted for it. Right? Okay, so that's the objectionable, objectionable point. Now, which was it? What did Brad, that was his name, the salesman, did he fall on the ethical or unethical side? I went back the next morning after I purchased the set to see if he had put another one in that space on the shelf or if it was truly empty. It was truly empty. Adam. All right. Well, good for Brad. <laughs> yes. So what I say there is I then went and wrote a five-star review for that place and for Brad. That's what... That's what we should do. And that's what we have to look out for. The true use of the principle versus the counterfeit fabricated uses of them. Yep. Well, what I love about that is, is you um, rewarded their uh, integrity on one of the key six principles, 
uh, scarcity um, with another one of the principles, actually two of them, which is social proof, right? right. You, you, you wrote the testimonial, but you're also an authority in the field. So you contributed authority as well. That's right. You, you got that right. <laughs> this is the circle of life of persuasion that we're <laughs> tracking here. Um, I just want to tack on to that, that, that story. That, that was a great way to sort of um, lay out the really conundrum we have when we're seeing these principles used in the wild that we, we don't necessarily know the intent of the agent, right? They might be good, like Brad turned out to be, but they might not be. And, and uh, there's a, an example of this that I read in your book that was similar, but I think even more nefarious, which was the, the used car salesman that advertises the too good to be true price on the car. You come in, you take it for a test drive. You're so excited because it's by far the best price you've seen for a car like this. They ask you if you want it. You say, of course, you know, let's get the deal done quickly before you realize what a great deal you're offering me. And then in between the paperwork, they come out and say, gosh, you know, somebody actually put the wrong price on the car. It's actually a lot higher. But for you, we won't give you the full sticker price, but we can't lose money on this car. How about we meet in the middle? And at this point, you've come down to the store, you've taken the test drive with the car, you've told them you love it. So your commitment and consistency has got you locked in. Yes. And you rationalize to yourself, look, am I really going to find a better price for a car like this anyways? And I've done all the work. Okay, I guess I'll take the car. And basically, they have sold you a car that you were not going to buy from them before you saw the fake price that they put out there. So this whole right. transaction has been engineered to manipulate you. Yes, there's, a, there's actually a, a label to that technique. It's called throwing the low ball. That first price is called a low ball. It's below any uh, uh, number that you actually expect to sell the car for. It's to get them to commit to it. And then a lot of times they'll say, oh, take it home for a drive, show it around work, right? And now, you know, you're in, in love with the car, your co-workers think that you've got this new car, and now they're going to take it away? Oh, no, no, no. I've made a commitment to this. All right, so they'll adjust the price up a little bit, but not to the price you would have bought it at in the first place. It's a very effective tactic. It is also against the, the law, by the way. To the crux of the whole interview here, how do we recognize and defend ourselves against the type of manipulation that is unethical, or, or at least, um, you know, you could, you could talk about some of these aggressive marketers. Maybe it's not unethical, but it's certainly not something I need in my life and want to be manipulated by. So I see you nodding here. I'm sure you get this question a lot. What, are, what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, for, uh, it turns out that it's not the same for each of the principles. One of the things I do in, in my book is to have a, a, a section at the end of each chapter called defense. How do you defend yourself against this? In the case of scarcity, the one that we just talked about, all right, uh, what happens when something is scarce is that we get agitated by the possibility of losing something. We, we get this emotional arousal. We should use it. The recognition of this arousal to cause us, wait a minute, I'm feeling physiologically agitated here. Stop. Step back. Ask yourself, do you really want this thing? Or are you just being steered toward it, toward it by the claim of its, its um, scarcity? Right? Because if I was told, hey, this is our last one, you, you know, it's the last, I might have said, oh, oh, my God, I, I better get it even if I didn't want that set. <laughs> right, right. But it turns well, out I did want that because I knew what Consumer Reports said about it. But if I didn't know that, I might have purchased something I didn't really want. So the key is use the, the force. You know how in the, um, uh, in, in, in the Star Wars movie, let the force be with you, right? Well, that's exactly it. Let that force be your cue wait a minute, I need to step back from this situation and analyze it in a considered way. On the basis of the merits of it, my current budget, and how much I really want it or need it. Okay, great. So um, I, I hate this term, but it's, it's if you feel yourself being emotionally triggered, um, that's your red flag. That's to say, you know what, I'm in an emotional state here. 
and, and maybe I'm here because someone's tried to push me there to make an emotional decision, I'm going to tell myself I can't make a decision in this state. I got to step back, let the rational mind take over, and only then will I let myself make a decision. Exactly. Same thing happens with the liking principle, where you find yourself, let's say in that uh, car sh uh, showroom, liking the salesman remarkably more than you should for a 35 minute interaction with him or her. Wait a minute. Is it that he gave me something, a cup of coffee? Is that he complimented me on my choice of options? Is that he told me that, uh, <clears throat> oh, really, uh, my wife grew up where you, uh, where you were born. What, all these things, and you come to like, and then you say to yourself, wait a minute, do I like this guy more than I should for 35 minutes? That's my signal to step back and realize I'm going to be driving this car off the lot, not the salesman. <laughs> the liking for him is irrelevant to the liking for the Absolutely. thing. And I have, to, I have to bring myself back to the merits of the deal, not the merits of the person who presented the deal to me. And so I presume, too, in, in all of this, knowledge is power, right? You know, understanding these principles of persuasion, you become better at just sort of recognizing them when you see them in action. And then you right. can sort of pick your defense accordingly, correct? Exactly right. Yeah. I, I got to ask, though, since you're the guy that came up with these and have lived with them for 30 plus years, um, does it ever sort of drive you insane? Like you are you able to kind of turn it off and just be a normal person in the world? Or do you go around every minute of every day seeing evidence of, of these arrows of persuasion being fired at you? My antenna are up all the time. <laughs> I Because there's always another edition of the book. There's the one that is just published uh, is, is the newest edition. And so I'm adding information, adding new ideas, even uh, a new principle. Uh, so I'm always alert to incoming. Okay, great. Well, let's actually talk about that for a second. So uh, I've talked about you know your excellent books. I've got a copy of Persuasion here. Uh, as I told you before we started recording, I went for my much-loved and dog-eared copy of Influence, and it was gone. And the reason why is my older daughter, who's at college and has become a psychology major, heard me raving about it and basically stole it and took it back to college with it. <laughs> um, but that book, Influence, that's really the seminal book that puts you in, in this whole framework on the map, was initially published around 30 years ago. But you've just come out with an expanded uh, version, a new edition. I think it's something like over 200 new pages. Yes. And it's even got a new principle in it. So um, what quickly can you tell us about what's in the new version of the book? And for people that are interested in getting a copy of it, and I understand it hasn't quite launched yet, where should they go? Well, they can certainly go to any of the book buying sites, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, that sort of thing. They can come to our website, uh, influenceatwork.com, uh, where they can get any of the books. But uh, that's those are the places to get it. What's different about it is that it now includes new research, new examples, new new insights into the process, but it also takes into account online platforms for influence. When the last edition was written 14 years ago, there was no online there in uh, commerce. There was no digital marketing. It didn't exist. Now, I've heard people say the book Influence is the Bible for digital commerce. It didn't exist digital <laughs> when the book was written. So it must be the Bible because the principles of influence that apply all when, when the book was written also apply to the, plat, the new platforms in which influence occurs, social media, uh, e-marketing, and so on. Well, so, you know, in the launch of the whole digital platform, there has emerged this new category of person on the internet called the influencer. And Bob, I'm gonna say, 
uh, you've been called the godfather of influence, but I think to all those influencers, you're the godfather of those influencers, whether you want to be or not, having published the Bible. Um, all right. Well, look, I, I would like to close here in Bob and asking where people can go to learn more about you and your work. Obviously, they can read the books. Um, you also mentioned your website. Maybe you could mention that one more time. We'll put the URL up on the screen. Yes, of course. It's influence at work. That's all one word, no spaces, dot com. All right. Well, Bob, look, thank you for giving us so much of your time, for giving so much to the world in terms of the insights that you've brought through with your whole framework around influence and persuasion. This has been an absolutely delightful interview. You know, they oftentimes say don't meet your heroes. They don't measure up. You definitely break that mold. So thank you. I've had just a phenomenal time with you here, and it's been a real honor. I hope we can have you back on the program at some point in the future. Uh, I, you know, I feel like we've just sort of scratched the surface of um, – to understanding our world through the lens of influence and persuasion. And uh, as uh, events develop uh, throughout uh, the future here, I would love to be able to share your perspective on that, given your your gift and your outlook with our audience. So hopefully- I'll we'll tell you, you what, Adam, it's a deal because you asked, uh, clearly you had done your homework and you asked <laughs> the questions that allowed me to get into the core issues and ideas of the material. Well, thank you. And now I'm liking you even more. So I think you're using <laughs> that liking uh, principle uh, for me here. Uh, but anyways, thank you so much. And uh, Bob, will, we'll have you again in the future. But best of luck with uh, the sales of the new edition of the book. I'm going to go get it after we hop off here. All right. Thanks.